Cooperative Economics and High Tech Profiling. This week, I'll talk with Nathan Schneider about everything for everyone, the radical tradition that just might save us from economic turmoil. And Virginia Eubanks explains how the high tech tools the governments are using profile the poor and automate inequality and what we can do about it. That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. It has been 10 years since the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the financial crash, and one thing we have learned since is that there exists in the United States not just one economy, but many. When it comes to the relationship between capital and labor, all sorts of models exist, from waged work, jobs, to barter, commoning and co-ops. Today's guest, Nathan Schneider, has just completed a book about cooperatives. While money media tend to regard anything alternative to the investor-owned corporation as aberrant or strange, he wants us to know that co-ops are actually as old as the republic itself, in fact older. As he puts it, the kind of business that now seems normal was once strange and someday it might seem strange again. Schneider's everything for everyone. The radical tradition that is shaping the next economy is just out from Nation Books. I'm glad it's brought him back to the program. Nathan, welcome back to The Laura Flounder Show. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. So when we say normal, uh, really, what do we mean? We mean a kind of economy that has helped shape the things we see around us, the world that we have, and some of the best things of uh, our economy, uh, uh, some of the best parts. Like what? Things like uh, Associated Press, a uh, media cooperative that enables small newspapers, publishers of all sorts to exist in an economy that's stacked against them. Or now people have no idea that the Associated Press it or has AP, been, whose byline they see in their local paper, is anything to do with the co-op. It has been since 1844-ish when it was founded. and. Uh, and is used that model in order to empower businesses around the world. It actually now reaches, uh, claim to reach at least, half the population of the planet every day. Amazing. Your grandfather was involved in a co-op. Tell us about Liberty Distributors. Well, this is something I you know, never knew growing up. I knew he always wore this belt buckle of this company he had worked with. And, uh, uh, and it was only after moving to Colorado in the last few years, digging through some uh, family records, I found the bylaws of his company and realized this was a, a purchasing cooperative for hardware stores around the country, enabling small stores in local communities to collectively buy hardware and uh, compete with the big box stores in the process. Now you say it also enabled him to endure for a long time, help to create an enormous or fairly large company, but never get rich. Well. He, there's that. Uh, he did well. He did well. But he was running a national business, you know, not getting fabulously wealthy, but doing important work, enable, doing something that he cared about. And also, um, I think it, it, that was surprising to me because I had come into this project on the tales of Occupy Wall Street. My last book was about Occupy Wall Street, and I'd followed those activists into this cooperative movement. And my grandfather was about as as opposite as you can possibly imagine from your average Occupy uh, anarchist-leaning activist. You know, this was a old conservative farm boy. Well, that's the thing about co-ops, isn't it? I mean, they come in all shapes and sizes. They have all sorts of political contexts, let's just put it that way, and inclinations. But there are certain, you call them veins and arteries, and, and that's the principles. Can, can you lay those out for us? Yeah, so this is, there's a set of seven of them that have been agreed to by uh, cooperatives around the world. They kind of descend from the 19th century industrial period, but they really have to do with ownership and governance. They have to do also with accountability. They're about ensuring that this is a kind of business in which the people who participate in it are in charge and the people who participate in it benefit, whether they're workers or customers or uh, uh, small businesses that are members. And, you know, these, these principles are, uh, are kind of a, a, a relic and a legacy that we have to build on, uh, something that is in our midst when we confront our own crisis of accountability. This is something that we should be able to turn to and build on in a way that I think we've largely forgotten. Mm. Now, one of the things that I appreciated you bringing to this story, I think the last time you and I were talking was about the Pope, um, was a awareness and an education um, that you put in the book for people like me about the, the roots of this practice that even precede anything like the principles, and in fact precede it by a long shot, um, going back to early Christianity, monasteries, and so forth. 
talk a bit about that fun connection between monks and jazz musicians um, and how you see that aspect of this still in today's tradition or have we lost it? Is it all just about business? Well, I, it was interesting in the course of working on this book, I found a few stories, a few examples of communities of young people who in facing the challenges of the post-2008 economy started turning to medieval and earlier antecedents to monasteries, to uh, medieval guilds, not because they were drawn by a particular religious uh, uh, enticement, but because they were, um, they were inspired by the fact that this is how previous generations had made their way through an economic transition. And they had done it through these modes of self-governance and, and a kind of early democracy. And, uh, and it was just striking to me that, that, that they would turn to something so old as a, as a signal of uh, the kind of dire challenge that they found themselves facing, that they understood themselves as facing a world historical shift. How did we shift away from those traditions? I mean, it was industrial capitalism, I guess, but a lot of people, as you frame it, who are advocates of cooperatives, particularly in the United States, particularly in the 1930s when there was a lot of socialism about cast their practice and their businesses as just American as, as capitalist apple pie. Well, it's, it's so striking. You know, that you can find these videos from the 30s, 40s, or even early 50s, where the U.S. government, for instance, you know, is, is uh, promoting cooperative development as, you know, this is the next step for democracy. We're going to take democracy past the ballot box and into our businesses, into our everyday lives, uh, uh, promoting it as a means of rural development. Uh, this was in economics textbooks. And it was really after World War II when the, the kind of illusion, I think, of a kind of um, industrial capitalist uh, uh, plentitude ended up just wiping this away and the Cold War really eviscerated any, but any uh, talk of, of this kind of model, even though it was still happening. So, you know, businesses like, you know, Sunkist or, or uh, uh, Lando Lakes Butter, right, you know, or even my grandfather's business were proceeding ahead with the cooperative model, using it to do stuff very different from what the big corporations were doing, supporting small producers especially, but they weren't talking about it. They weren't proud of that cooperative, uh, 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 that cooperative model because they kind of had to lay low and pretend we're just good old fashioned American capitalism. So what did we lose from that? We lost this tradition, that this recognition that this is a powerful way of doing business. You know, this is a, a, a way of really shaping an economy that works and that works better and better for people than a top-down investor-driven model. You know, it's hard to believe what happened in the 1930s after uh, uh, the Rural Electrification Act just enabled uh, cooperatives, uh, electric utility cooperatives to access uh, loans at the cost that banks are getting their, their money. Um, suddenly, within a decade or so, you had nearly all of rural America electrified. That is an astonishing accomplishment, um, demonstrating that these models are financeable, scalable, and, uh, and powerful if we allow ourselves to, to recognize that. You do present quite a few hiccups along the way, though, in this book. I mean, one of the things I love about it is you present cooperative experimentation with it, warts and all. Absolutely. And, and part of that is just a recognition of what happens when we don't have the infrastructure. You know, I, I, I lately have been working with like startup businesses a lot, especially in the tech world. And, you know, a lot of them are really dumb ideas. Most startups don't work out. Right. And, you know, that's fine. That's what you need to figure out what is going to work. The trouble is, is there's so much money and energy put toward those who are willing to sell their business to investors, right? And there are a lot of good ideas among people who would really rather, you know, share their businesses with their communities, make a nice return, but, you know, maybe not be uh, uh, kind of Bill Gates style uh, 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 outcomes. But, but those, those businesses in many sectors don't have the infrastructure, not like farmers have built for a century in this country where we've got a, you know, $128 billion farmer cooperative bank, co-bank down the road. In the UK, I had a chance recently to talk with the leader of the Labour Party, the second largest party in that country, a guy who could become prime minister, about the presence of cooperatives in that party's massively successful and popular uh, manifesto. Here's Jeremy Corbyn's answer. 
You have never place for co-ops in your manifesto. Absolutely. Um, co-ops are something that's intrinsic to the British Labour movement. And across the world, they're massive. There's a billion people. One in six of the world's populations are either users or members of a co-op of some form. So what we're proposing is national investment, proper taxation for the very richest, and empowerment of communities through local spending, local investment, and empowering people to determine their own lives. Social justice, socialism. Now he's not trying to cast it as a tried and true type of capitalism, something quite else. Um, that might or might not fly in the United States, who knows. What would fly in terms of smart policy at the federal or state level, take your pick, um, to provide more of that infrastructure that you're talking about for cooperatively owned business? Well, it's striking. You know, just recently tucked into the latest Defense Authorization Act, unfortunately, in my view, uh, the um, uh, there was a Main Street Employee Ownership Act, you know, a new uh, law that was uh, uh, really led by, uh, by Democrats, but actually ended up becoming a bipartisan bill. And it allows more um, access to financing for small uh, uh, worker-owned businesses and conversions from other kinds of businesses. You know, this is just one example uh, demonstrating how this is a, a bipartisan idea, you know, uh, kind of shocking in a moment where nothing seems yeah. to, to cross these lines. And, and just as Corbyn can talk about this as a kind of socialism, he's not wrong about that. Um, others who identify with the language of capitalism can see cooperatives in that language as well. It's not quite another kind of capitalism. It's not investor driven, it's not investor controlled, but it, it resonates with values that, that cross these usual lines. And we've already seen that. The, the National Congressional um, Co-op Caucus is split by Bartison down the middle. I think we have a tremendous opportunity to allow those kinds of financing mechanisms that we saw in the 1930s uh, to, to uh, ensure that our governments are supporting investing in cooperative businesses locally rather than trying to lure extractive businesses into their communities, spending all kinds of money to do that. Um, uh, there are, you know, also in tech regulation, ensuring that our new online platforms are really accountable to us rather than simply trying to kind of do a whack-a-mole uh, hodgepodge of regulations that are really just creating barriers for new entrants. And are you seeing many politicians take on this, these issues as part of their platform, their manifesto, if you like, their agenda? They're starting to, even uh, uh, more than they have in the past. A lot of politicians have relationships with cooperatives um, uh, kind of quietly, but I think we have an opportunity to make this a real issue. Um, and, and already we've seen during the early years of the Trump administration, Democrats, for instance, uh, starting to craft uh, legislation about supporting worker ownership, about supporting credit unions, they seem to be moving in this direction. And actually, in some respects, they're actually coming to things that Republicans have been talking about for a long time. It's an eerie thing, but, but the opportunity here is uh, really unusual and, um, and I think in a way unexpected. Mm. You have a candidate in Colorado who's talking about co-ops. That's right, uh, Jared Polis, who is a congressman uh, currently uh, in my district, uh, now running for, for governor actually began his campaign at a worker-owned grocery store. He has been meeting with cooperative leaders across the state. Um, he himself is a, you know, an, a businessman, investor, and you know, startup founder, um, but in some ways saw the power of employee ownership in his own businesses and um, is, is excited about this as a model for challenging wealth inequality and for building you know, a durable kind of uh, business climate in the state. You end the book by talking about ownership, which is a, a challenging question. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn supports co-ops as the best private sector alternative to public ownership, publicly owned businesses. Um, there are a lot of socialists that see co-ops as a nasty concession to, to capitalism. When we did our special on you know, things to think about when you're creating a co-op, it was called Own the Change, and we had big conversations about, well, are we changing the attitude towards ownership um, or not? Uh, how are you thinking about it? And when you say that these models of cooperatively owned business could actually wither ownership, or some of them, um, are you seeing that happen anywhere? 
Well, I think we need to become artists of ownership. Okay. You know, recognize that ownership is a fluid medium. It's something that is crafted through law and through contract and through, through practice. And um, I, I think there's been a tendency in my generation, I've seen and experienced, to kind of want to relinquish it mm -hmm. and enter the sh a sharing economy where everything is shared. And it, but really, it turns out to be a situation where everything is rented and, you know, those bosses, you know, are not giving up their ownership. So my view is kind of like, until they give up ownership, nobody else should. We need to learn how to practice it more creatively and make sure that we are, um, that whatever economy we're moving into, we're coming into it from a, from a place of more uh, uh, power and control over our lives. And you know, when you, we're, we're in a moment where inequality is being driven by inequalities of ownership. Um, we have to start there before we can talk about what comes mm. next. Well, what comes next may come sooner rather than later. People predict that 10 years after the Lehman triggered collapse, um, we could be seeing the next one sooner than we'd like. Are we in a different place than where we were a decade ago in terms of seeing alternatives? I hope so. I mean, we, we were in a moment of such a lack of imagination 10 years ago and in the years following. I think, I think you know, for instance, that Occupy Wall Street moment was such a, uh, so much about imagination. It was so much about reclaiming and recognizing, oh, we haven't even asked ourselves what we really want, right? And um, I hope that now we're in a moment where um, 10 years of experiments, you know, we've seen an incredible grassroots revival of this cooperative movement. I hope that when, if this happens again, when, um, we come forward with a whole bunch of proposals and a whole bunch of power behind them saying, you know, we need credit unions to be powerful enough to be a meaningful alternative to, to commercial banks. We need uh, uh, systems, uh, corporations, uh, uh, that are accountable to local communities and actually want to support local businesses. You know, we need an internet that is accountable to the people whose data is being stored on the servers. You know, all of these things need to be uh, uh, not only part of our, um, our imagination, but uh, a part of our process of building power behind it. And everything for everyone needs to be part of all our libraries. I certainly hope so. Nathan, thank you so much for coming in. Great to Thank you, to you, Laura. We're in a moment where we should have real concerns about the uses that new database technologies are being put to. So, and all I mean when I say that are things like predictive analytics, or automated decision-making tools, uh, algorithms, um, because they're having just a massive impact on our communities and we're often not having the political conversations we should be having about what that means. And so for the past close to 10 years, I've been working on um, a, a book that I just finished called uh, Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile Police and Punish the Poor, where I tell a number of stories about how these new technologies are being integrated into public services uh, across the country. So I talk about um, an automated decision-making machine, an automated eligibility system in welfare in the state of Indiana. Um, an electronic registry that's supposed to match the most vulnerable unhoused people with the most appropriate available resource in Los Angeles, and a predictive model that's supposed to be able to guess which children might be victims of abuse or neglect in the future in Allegheny County, which is in um, uh, near Pittsburgh, is the county that Pittsburgh is in. I think mostly what's missing is the point of view of the families who feel targeted by these systems, right? So the systems that I talk about in Automating Inequality are all um, targeted at poor and working families. Um, and from their point of view, these systems often look really different. So they feel like um, that they're being diverted from shared resources that they are entitled to and deserve and need to, to um, keep their families safe and healthy. Um, so in Indiana, for example, um, they created an automated eligibility system that denied a million welfare applications in the first three years um, that it was working, um, which is a 50% increase from the three years before the tool was introduced. Um, and there, we are also seeing families who feel like, or I'm hearing from families, um, that they also feel like they are being subjected to a kind of punitive scrutiny, um, which actually makes them more vulnerable, even though it's often talked about as 
um, bringing them more resources or identifying risks sooner. Um, families actually often feel like they're being criminalized um, for decisions they haven't even made yet. So uh, one of the origin stories I tell about the creation of the book is um, I've been working both in welfare rights and economic justice movements for a long time and also in community technology. So I sort of came up uh, in the 90s in the Bay Area of California as a community technology activist. Um, and so I've spent a lot of my life building out resources in collaboration with marginalized communities um, around the country. And I was sitting in one of these labs that I helped build in my hometown of Troy, New York, in um, what was basically an, uh, it was a residential YWCA. So it was kind of like a single room occupancy hotel for low income women. And I was sitting there one day with um, somebody I worked really closely with who goes by a pseudonym in the book. Uh, she goes by Dorothy Allen in the book. And we were talking about her electronic benefits transfer card, her EBT card. Um, and uh, she said, oh, you know, they're great. Uh, they're, they, they you know, lower stigma in the grocery store and they're a little bit more convenient. She said, but, you know, at the same time, my caseworker uses it to track all of my spending and all of my movements. And I must have had this like super shocked look on my face because she then said, oh, right, like you didn't know that. And then got really, she sort of laughed at me for a minute, but then she got really thoughtful and she said, oh, Virginia, you know, you, you all, meaning sort of professional middle class people, you all should pay attention to what's happening to us, those moms on welfare, because they're coming for you next. And I really feel like that insight was hugely important for my work, both because it helped me remember to start uh, where problems are most uh, clear, most obvious, and most pressing, which is often in uh, historically disadvantaged communities. Um, but also it reminded me that um, often people who live in places that you could think of as low rights environments um, serve as sort of canaries in the coal mine for these new technologies. They're experimental populations for our most sort of intrusive, invasive technologies. And so if we care about social justice, um, then that's where we need to start, is in places like the welfare office, in places like prisons, um, in places like refugee camps. That's where we need to start. So one of the things that's really great about being where we are right now, which is at the 2018 Allied Media Conference, um, is that it is this incredible space where we have really difficult conversations about media and technology and social justice, but that um, the folks who are here are makers, right? Like they, they're organizers, they're activists, so they make spaces and they make movements, but they also make stuff, they make media. Um, so one of the things that's super exciting about being here is hearing the kinds of really innovative solutions that people are already um, exploring. And I think particularly around new technologies, we have a tendency to feel like they're more complicated than they really are or that the solutions are more complex than they really are. And that's kind of a it's a it's a form of math washing. Right. It's a story we get told about how we're not smart enough to actually understand the systems or, or the solutions to the problems that the systems are supposed to address. And I, I mean, I think the first step is we don't buy that story, right? Is we say, actually, like we might, and, and it's true, there might be a really technically complicated system that takes a little bit of breaking down for us to understand, but we understand the problems and we understand the solutions. And we understand actually even some of the really complicated um, technologies that are out there once we have the language, the basic language to do it. So um, I've been here in part with a, in this incredible team of folks I've been working with for the last three years called the Our Data Bodies Project. Um, and one of the things that's really fantastic about that work is that people often assume, you know, folks who are the targets of these most invasive systems just don't understand what's going on. And what we found in two years of interviews is in some of the most marginalized neighborhoods in the United States is people know a lot about what's going on. Um, they already have an analysis of how this stuff is impacting their lives. Um, and even more exciting, they already have solutions, right? So they have solutions around how they do self-defense on a day-to-day -day level and how they survive. Um, but they also have all sorts of really smart policy suggestions and these incredible visions for making more vibrant, more just communities. And so I really think it's about um, listening. Um, and a huge part of my own work is around trying to tell better stories about these systems. Stories that aren't just about how the technologies work, but about how the technologies make people feel, what that experience is like, 
um, and what it feels like from the inside. And then the impacts it's having on communities right now. Because I think often when we talk about this stuff, we have a tendency to talk about it as if the problems might arise in the future. <laughs> when in fact, a lot of the problems are already happening right now. And I think the other thing that really needs to happen is that we have to be telling our stories. Um, so very much in my role as a storyteller, I feel like part of my work is um, pushing back on the flattening of people's whole selves down to data, right? So one of the ways we talk about it is um, in the Our Data Bodies project is as, as the data body. And the data body is often this sort of flattened, decontextualized story that's written about you based on information that's collected either about you or about people like you. And what we've definitely found as a team during the research is that people resent having their story flattened in that way. And they wanna be recognized, they wanna be heard, um, uh, and they wanna be seen, um, not looked at and analyzed. Um, and they wanna be recognized as full human beings in their context. Mm -hmm.